They say that after his awakening, when the Buddha surveyed the world with the eye of a Buddha, he saw all the beings on fire. Like we chanted last night, on fire with passion, aversion, delusion, sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair. He, however, was no longer on fire. And so he spent 45 years teaching other people, other beings, how to put out their fires. It's a sign of his great compassion. We tend to forget that, that the whole underlying motive for his teaching was just this, goodwill for all beings. Seeing that we all want happiness. In fact, if you look at almost everything you do, whether you're articulated or not, is for happiness, for pleasure, ease. And yet in spite of that, we end up creating a lot of suffering for ourselves and the people around us. And Buddha himself saw that he was creating suffering for himself that he didn't need to. He wanted to find a way out, and not just for himself, for anyone else who was willing to listen. So the underlying motive for even undertaking the path to become a Buddha was goodwill. And once he became the Buddha, he was able to act on that motive in a total way, finding and having found a way that you could totally free the mind from suffering. That's what he went out to teach. So it's ironic when you think of all the people who accuse Buddhism of being pessimistic or of Theravada of being selfish. It's not the case at all. You said there is total release from suffering. That's the opposite of pessimism. And he taught everybody who was willing to listen, who was willing to put the teachings into practice. Because as you saw, he, having overcome the problem of suffering in his own heart, he couldn't just wave a magic wand and have everybody else up, stop suffering. This is something that each of us creates for him or herself alone. It's our own lack of skill that makes us suffer. And because you can't master a skill for somebody else, this is a path that each of us has to practice for him or herself. But the results aren't fe felt only by you or only by the person who practices. They spread around. They say that a John Munn every day would practice spreading thoughts of goodwill. As soon as he woke up in the morning, goodwill for all beings. When he woke up from his midday nap, goodwill for all beings. And before he went to bed at night, goodwill for all beings. It established the context for the practice. And kept the mind on the path, even as you're falling asleep, you think goodwill for all beings. Then you can't let your mind wander off into areas where it shouldn't go. Of course, this kind of wish, goodwill for all beings, if, if it just stops there at the wish, it becomes an empty thought, begins to dry out. You have to find ways of implementing it, and you start at home. One of the reasons we work with the breath to make the breath comfortable is to give you a good place to stay. Because when you have a sense of ease in the body, you're much less likely to want to go out and ca cause harm to other beings. And you become more sensitive to how you cause harm for yourself. When you get very sensitive to the impact of thoughts on the breath and the body, then when an unskillful thought comes up, you notice it. You say, Gosh, this really hurts. Just thinking it hurts. And you look at the content and the thought, and there's really nothing worth following through there. It just creates more suffering, more trouble. 
and when you're coming from a sense of ease, a sense of well-being, a sense of strength, because you're not constantly inflicting yourself with suffering, you become stronger. When you come from this position of ease and strength, you're much, much less likely to act on any, any thoughts that are harmful. So creating this inner sense of ease is a gift not only to yourself, but all the people around you. And it's a very visceral way of implementing thoughts of goodwill. You sense it immediately. Now it has to come with practice, because many times we're, we're used to breathing in unskillful ways, just as we're used to thinking in unskillful ways. And so when we're told to adjust the breath, we adjust the breath in unskillful ways. But if you're observant, you can get more and more skillful. This is the whole reason why the, one of the central concepts the Buddha teaches, busala, skillfulness. It opens a way to get out of our old habits, because a skill is something a human being can develop. And there are gradations of skillfulness. And and you move from lack of skill to skill by being observant. It simply requires patience. It requires sensitivity and it also develops sensitivity. Once you become more and more sensitive to the breath, as I said, you become more sensitive to the mind. You become more sensitive to the things you say, the ways you think. And you begin to see where you're causing suffering, where you're causing stress, because you have a sense of ease against which to measure it. And this technique of learning how to relax the body, learning how to relax the breath so it flows smoothly through the body, is crucial. Because the nature of the mind is that it's always looking for happiness, it's always looking for ease. And if it can't find any inside, it's going to go wandering out, hunting for food outside. Sometimes it goes out and noses around in piles of garbage, looking for something to eat out there. And for the most part, it finds disappointment. And there's some satisfaction out there. If there weren't any satisfaction, nobody would go out there. But it's a pretty miserable position to be in when your happiness depends on a food source that you can't depend on. I was reading this evening a book review of a book on children in Germany during World War II. Not only Germans, but also the people who lived under the Germans. And one of the themes was how hunger is not only physically limiting, but also becomes morally limiting as well. There were the Polish children or the Jewish children living under the Germans were really, really starving. The things they went, the things they would do in order just to get something to put in their mouths. It's because we're driven. We've got this body that needs to eat, and if it doesn't get enough, the mind changes as well. They can start thinking of doing things that ordinarily wouldn't think of doing at all. So you owe it to yourself and to the people around you to find a source of happiness for the mind that doesn't have to, to begin with, doesn't have to feed outside. Ultimately, you want to get to the point where you don't have to feed at all, where the mind is strong enough that it doesn't have to impose on anything, it doesn't have to rely on anything for its happiness. It's totally complete in and of itself. The one step in that direction is learning how to produce your own sense of ease from within, so that you're less likely to go out nosing around for food in places where it, the food is bad for you, or where you have to fight off other people nosing around through the same garbage pile. As long as you've got something good to feed on inside, then 
much less likely, much less likely to get involved in conflict outside, or imposing and creating burdens for people outside, because you're not feeding on them. You're not fighting them for food. So again, this ability to create a sense of ease simply by the way you breathe, and, and the breath is free. It's one of the few things I haven't privatized yet. It's always there, coming in, going out, and you have the choice of how you want to breathe. So if you can maximize this potential here, you really have got yourself in a good position. You create a sense of ease and you're less burdensome to the people around you. You become more reliable. You can re rely on yourself. And the people around you can depend on you, too. So working with the breath, getting skillful, getting observant about what works and what doesn't work, and allowing the breath to flow freely through the body. It's a visceral, very immediate, and very lasting way of showing goodwill, both for yourself and for all beings.